Dzień dobry raz jeszcze. Kłania się Państwu Ernest Wyciszkiewicz, dyrektor Centrum Polsko-Rosyjskiego Dialogu i Porozumienia, organizatora dzisiejszej konferencji. Może na wstępnie powiem kilka słów o Centrum, żebyśmy wiedzieli dlaczego zajęliśmy się tym problemem. Centrum jest instytucją publiczną powołaną przed sześciu laty mocą ustawy działającą pod auspicjami Ministra Kultury i Dziedzictwa Narodowego. Powołaną, jak głosi nazwa, po to, aby działać na rzecz polsko-rosyjskiego dialogu. Po to, aby ten dialog kiedyś przy bardziej sprzyjających okolicznościach doprowadził do porozumienia. Zajmujemy się wieloma rzeczami. Poczynając od wymiany młodzieży, w której już do tej pory wzięło udział kilka tysięcy młodych osób z Polski i z Rosji. Przyznajemy stypendia dla młodych badaczy z Rosji. Prowadzimy działalność wydawniczą. We are publishers. We also organize quite a bit of public uh, events, uh, workshops, seminar, conferences, and others. Every day we attempt to host two large international conferences in Poland devoted to important issues around the history of Poland and relations of Poland uh, with our neighbors. Also, research plays an important part of our activities. We've been involved in research from the very outset, and that research pursues very interesting topics from the point of view of historians or the public interest of Poland. This is why we attempt regularly and consistently to invite to Poland researchers from Russia, from Western Europe and from Poland to speak about important issues. Indeed, 1917, this year's repercussions for Poland and for this part of the world were of utmost importance. Let me remind you that Poland is also a very important part and parcel of the revolution. Before uh, the partition, uh, the territory that Polish took up before the partitions were, was occupied by the Russian Empire and uh, the turmoil in the Empire created a totally new scene for the Polish independence. It has so happened that Poland had to fight for its independence against the Bolshevik state. At that time we won, but from a broader perspective we will also see in that year 1917 the roots of the later division of the world and Europe and the sources of experience of the nations uh, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe as far as the perception of those events is concerned. The Iron Carton that fell in 1945 also heavily impacted the research because it was principally impossible in Poland to uh, investigate, to explore uh, the periods of the revolution. So the Polish historians couldn't take, the, take part in the debate in uh, Western Europe with the various uh, viewpoints and Poland was dominated by the classical Soviet perception. Uh, after 1989, we started being able, being, being free to conduct such uh, research in an open fashion. And we thought that it's very important to also involve the Western scientists and their perceptions into the debate to bring them in. And what was also the perspective of the nations of that regions, and that includes also Russians, the Russian nation. This is very important today because the Russian state, the Russian Federation has been very actively using the revolution and those events in their uh, historic, historical policy. So we are very happy that you followed our invitation today. I I wish you very inspiring debates and I cordially thank you for coming. So why don't we start the first panel 
which will be devoted to the history and historiography of the revolution of 1917. Thank you very much. And good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Łukasz Adamski. I am the deputy director of the Polish-Russian uh, Understanding or Center for Understanding. And I'll be quite happy to moderate the first panel. As the director said, we are going to focus during this panel on the historiographics or historical disputes about the events that took place in that part of Europe and the, on the former territory of the Russian Empire. We decided that this is going to be a very good introduction into the topic and thereby also uh, as well encourage our discussions. But moreover, it seems that historiographical interpretations impact very much of the common remembrance and also of the current politics. The attitude towards the Russian Revolution is also, um, as to a certain extent, a function of the attitudes towards Soviet, the Soviet Union, which happened later. We are going to discuss it amongst uh, three very prominent researchers of this topic. The first speaker on my uh, left-hand side it will be Marek, Professor Marek Kornat. He represents the Institute of History of the Polish Academy of Science. Then he also is uh, active in the legal department of the Cardinal Wyszyński University. But he is more associated with Krakow. He is specialist in the field of Polish diplomacy, Polish uh, political thought, and Polish Sovietology. And he is a very prominent with a very promising, uh, prominent um, paperwork. Uh, the second speaker is going to be Professor Steve Smith, one of the fam world's famous researchers into the Russian Revolution, author of many books. Today he is working on a, comparison, on a comparison of the Stalinist policy and the policy of China at the times of Mao Zedong. And the finally, the final speaker, Professor Adam Boschatsky, the director of the legal, of the Institute of Law of the University of Warsaw. He is also the historian of law, historian of the political system, and of the political thought. He was, he has been involved for many years and the research of the Russian political system, and he specialized in this field. Before I give the floor to the first speaker, may I just give you one housekeeping announcement. Of the, we always thought that the point in all our conferences is a free discussion. However, for this conference, at this conference, we don't have too much discussion time. But if the speakers sp uh, keep the time of 20 minutes allocated, then we'll have some time left for discussion. So I uh, really uh, urge the speakers to keep of the timing. And I give the floor to the first speaker, Professor Kornat, you have the floor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. In a very short paper uh, that I have, I just like to briefly outline the historiography of this period. Uh, we know that the second Polish Commonwealth was the neighbor of the new communism Russia. And that evoked quite a bit of interest amongst the Polish intellectuals for what uh, was then happening in that country. Since, however, these were very 
fresh events, very recent events. That made it difficult, or this resulted in the fact that historiography didn't really care about this topic. Um, at the Vilnius University, and Vilnius was a part of Poland, uh, the Vilnius University was very famous, but it generally didn't take up the uh, Russian Revolution as a historical topic, but rather it focused on the research and uh, the political system of the new communist Russia. And the His Institute of History, uh, the very famous Sovietologist, Professor Vitor Sukhennitsky, was employed and was uh, working. Before I give you my intended overview, may I emphasize that the historical uh, documentation and publications uh, devoted to the revolution of 1917, the Bolshevik revolution and the Soviet political system was huge at that time. This topic was very frequently addressed. Ambitious books were written, although they didn't have a purely scientific nature. One of those books was that of Stanislav Grabsky, who published uh, The Revolution back in 1922. This is a forgotten book but today, but in his document he compared the Bolshevik Revolution to the French Revolution. And there are many other ambitious books too. Uh, may I just start my overview of, uh, with saying a few words on uh, Jan Konarzewski, who started writing a large uh, book on the genesis of the revolution, the analysis of the Soviet system, under the title From uh, the White to the Red Tsarism. The narrative of that book encompassed uh, the Tsarist despotism all the way through the new Bolshevik uh, despotism. I will not bore you with uh, giving an overview of all the thoughts of uh, Professor Konashevsky. Uh, it uh, would suffice to say that he formulated theory of the Russian revolutionary maximalism, which is, in his words, uh, a unique uh, transformation of the Western ideology of Marxism and its adaptation to the Russian circumstances. He failed to address the whole process. Uh, he wrote seven bands of the seven volumes of the book, but uh, the book was burned in his apartment during the war uprising in 1944. Another opinion about the revolution uh, and the Bolshevism and the Soviet political system was that of Konstantin Grzybowski, the later professor of the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, one of the creators of the political sciences in Poland. In his brief paper, which contained his views of the Soviet political system, he emphasized the fact that Bolshevism should be interpreted as a new religion. He emphasized the mysticism, mysticism, I think, Eastern mysticism in its approach to the Western ideology that was transplanted onto Russia. He also emphasized the results of that fact 
of the impact of that fact on the shaping of the new political system uh, after the revolution. In his book, which was uh, intended to have two volumes and published 1938 in, as the first volume, which uh, reached 1937 or 6, rather, including uh, the new Stalinist constitution. Uh, in his view, in his book, he claims the author claims that, that the revolution was a classical coup d'etat in the capital city and the revolution spread to the, or by way of conquest of the country by the new elite that actually consisted of uh, the uh, well, new act activists which came to power thanks to the outcome of the war and uh, the turmoil that happened after the February Revolution. Another topic is, or another uh, author is Professor Václav Komarnicki, who is a professor at uh, the Vilnius University, but he didn't work in the Sovietology Institute there. His paper, The New System of the Soviet State, published in 1938, implemented uh, the uh, notion of ideocracy that he imported from Germany. The author of this uh, notion was uh, Wald one Waldemar Gurian, a Jewish-Russian immigre in Germany, who was author of many important books. Komarnitsky, as he used this term, also used the term of ideological oligarchy in his attempt to describe the Bolshevik regime. We should also um, refer to or mention the new this, the discussion about totalism rather than totali totalitarianism that sparked in the times between the wars in Poland. The notion was totalism because totalitarianism um, was born in Italy in the 1920s, but it came to Poland only later in America. It uh, permeated only in the early 1940s. However, in the Polish literature, uh, the notion was totalism because of the German root word totalism. However, there was a difference there. In, Germ in the German language version, the totalism suggests creating a single party state, liquidating the political pluralism and encompassing the entire political life of the state. Totalitarianism, however, goes even further because it attempts to control, to submerge people under control from inside so that uh, the ob uh, so that the state ideology becomes the object of one's beliefs uh, many interesting interpretation are um, ideas created or were created around totalism augmented by the whole topic of the Stalinist revolution. After World War II, the freedom of Sovietology studies in Poland, to put it mildly, disappeared. I'll revisit this topic, but before that, I will start by giving you a short overview of what is, was happening during the immigration. Back in 1930, uh, what did, Professor Władysław Konarzewski published an abbreviated version of his seven-volume book. In America, Konarzewski picked the most important fragment of the origin 
uh, book, and he published it under the title Origins of Modern Russia. Kucharzewski was not a scientific employee uh, at that time, so this book didn't uh, inject any new thoughts. He died, by the way, in the 1950s. But it all, it's all sort of strongly rocked a boat at this, uh, those times because he expressed certain issues that struck root in, this, uh, in the American Sovietology. Stanisław Świeniewicz was a very important name. He barely escaped an execution in Katyn. And he dealt with the Soviet political system, becoming the, one of the world's most prominent specialists in the field of using forced labor in the totalitarian regime. His book. Uh, and entitled Forced Labor in the Developed Countries also uh, included the Soviet example of forced labor. Also, Viktor Sukhenitsky uh, dealt with this topic, but he then shifted from Sovietology and focused on pure history, especially in the, of the, on the history of, the so of the Eastern Europe in the uh, first half of, uh, the 20, of, of the 20th century. Uh, he wrote a book, among many others, called Columbus's Error. He believed that the evolution of revolution after Lenin's death didn't give uh, rise to communism, but instead resulted of terribly repressive Regime. He claimed in his book that Lenin indeed showed a way to something what he thought to have been socialism. So that was his Columbus's error. That's what he wrote in his book. In emigration, and I believe that was quite strong, this post Polish immigration. Uh, not many books on the Soviet Revolution, Bolshevik Revolution, uh, were written. People wrote rather about contemporary political topics. Uh, the, those publications include at least two books. Uh, a journalist, Stefan Wojtomski, published a book on the Peace of Brest, Peace Treaty of Brest, one of uh, the most uh, of one of the earliest steps of the newly established Lenin's government. Uh, Professor Bregman was another author of the book called The Best Hitler's Ally, in which he analyzed the relations between Germany and uh, the Soviet Union. <laughs> also, Konstanty Grzybowski, whom I already mentioned, dealt with the topic too. We should also emphasize his deliberations on the modification of law that we find in Lenin's work. He also drew heavily from the pre-war text, but he shed a new light on them and offered a new interpretation of them. What is definitely worth emphasizing, he focused in his book on extraordinary circumstances, namely the hostile capitalistic environment and the intervention, the meddling into the Soviet revolutions, and he regarded them as the factors that heavily impacted the Lenin's um, let's say a concept of the integration so on, and he uh, really, really emphasized the MEP, New Economic Policy, as a true manifestation of Leninism at work. 
ale tylko na marginesie, bo one Now, we nie dotyczą tego, also need to mention mówimy, some other works. For example, those by Ludwig Bazilov, a professor of Wolsey University, who did not write a monography about the Bolshevik Revolution. For reasons we can only guess about. That wouldn't have been possible without uh, a very significant distortion of what uh, could have been said about it. But Professor Basilov was the author of the, uh, the very good book on the demise of the czarist system, that's the February Re Revolution, of course. And it's a very good publication that uh, you can still read uh, today without uh, really detecting any traces of uh, political ideology. Lenin's thought was also um, analyzed by Marek Waldenberg, a professor from uh, Krakow, Krakow, who uh, studied political sciences for many years. And very clearly, in his study of Lenin's political thought, very clearly um, he emphasized this was an armed uprising in the capital. He emphasized the concepts of uh, the proletariat's dictatorship, the uh, smashing of the old uh, apparatus of power, which was the um, key element for Lenin. And he emphasized that the theory of the proletariat's dictatorship is the opposite of democracy. The ideological background and different propositions in that work would not be accepted today, but there were some elements that were hidden, so to say, or smuggled in that text, and I believe that those statements, those propositions are worth uh, remembering. Now, let me also mention two historians of uh, ideas who remain quite well known abroad, Leszek Kowakowski and Andrzej Balicki. No. Neither, neither of them studied the revolution uh, per se, not the not the Lenin's revolution of 1917, but they wrote about it in other works. Kowakowski's history that has been translated to uh, foreign languages, he interpreted Bolshevism as the utopia of absolute freedom of man. When writing about Lenin, he mentioned three uh, ideas that were original and new. First of all, the alliance with the peasantry in a country that was economically backward and uh, the proletariat in that country was originally a weak uh, group. Now, secondly, he writes, Kowakowski writes that Lenin was very much interested in the national cause, but the national cause was a reservoir of energy to be used in the struggle against the uh, Russian Empire and the Tsarist system. So the national cause was an important tool uh, for uh, uh, polemics and agitation for Lenin. And finally, the party as the avant-garde or the spearhead of the proletariat, and then finally the theory of the proletariat's dictatorship. In uh, his book on Marxism, um, Kowakowski also analyzed the views of the proponents of Marxism, and amongst them, uh, Lenin was given a lot of space in that book. 
Now, in um, his book, Walicki opposed Kuchorzewski's um, statement about the special conditions in Russia that uh, were good ground for the growth of a new type of despotism. For Walicki, Russia was a theater, a um, certain space in which an experiment was conducted. And in this way, uh, Russia gave an example in history, and here we can quote Chadayev, who spoke about it. And when analyzing Lenin's uh, ideas and uh, different interpretations of history, Walicki warned us not to treat uh, this approach as the essence of Leninism, which was in line with um, Lenin's uh, ideas. It was just a tactical step, Walicki says, that was uh, forced upon him by the circumstances. Now, to wrap up, uh, three points by way of a summary. First of all, in all these different uh, views and attitudes that I mentioned briefly, the concept of ideocratic government was uh, uh, fundamental for the new type of despotism created by the Bolshevik Revolution. Secondly, the October Revolution was uh, basically perceived in Polish historiography as an armed coup. And finally, the theory developed by Sukiennitsky uh, well, was one of the most important uh, uh, elements or, or lines of thought in the Polish historiography. Thank you. Thank you very much for this brilliant review of the key Polish uh, Sovietologist works. And it's very interesting to see how many concepts were developed in the 20s and the 30s, and they are still alive. For example, the revolutionary maximalism or Bolshevism as a new religion, or the, the idea that what was called October Revolution in the Soviet uh, interpretation was only a, a military coup d'etat. And finally, the oligarchical approach, that's also a very interesting theoretical take on the interpretation of these events. Let me now give the floor to the second speaker. Now, you do not have to speak standing up you actually are encouraged to remain seated if you prefer. Let me now give the floor to Professor Steve Smith, who is going to talk about a similar topic, I believe. Well, I'd like to begin by um, thanking the Institute for um, this very kind uh, invitation to, to speak. Um, I'm going to um, talk rather more concretely about uh, recent historiography of violence, mainly as it relates to the civil war in Russia, so the period from 1918 to 21. As you all know, the Civil War was a period when economic, political and social structures collapsed, giving way to unprecedented levels of violence. This was a period which saw not only a very brutal war between Reds and Whites, but of Reds against the so-called democratic counter-revolution, those socialist revolutionaries, SRs, who had won the Constituent Assembly elections, 
It saw war between uh, the Reds and foreign interventionist forces. It saw war ra waged by various nationalist armies, including Poland. Um, it saw Atamani, warlords, struggling to control territory and to plunder resources. Crucially, it saw massive uprisings by peasants, resisting food requisitioning and conscription. It saw local communities using the breakdown of authority in order to settle historical grievances. And at times, it was a war of almost unimaginable barbarity, one in which peasants boiled alive commissars, in which Cossacks buried their enemies alive. In short, a veritable smuta. I'm not going to talk um, so much about the work of individual historians, though um, I will mention a few. My um, concern is rather to begin by sketching some recent conceptual approaches to thinking about violence, and then to discuss more substantive historical issues, of which, if I get time, there will be five. Um, these are, first, the relationship of the First World War to the Russian Civil War. Second, the question of ideology in the Civil War. Third, red and white terror. Fourth, uh, popular violence. And fifth, the relationship of um, civil war to state building, or perhaps more precisely, the role of civil war in um, state building. As we all know, all revolutions are about the breakdown of the state's monopoly of violence, the appearance of new contenders for power who use violence as one of the tools to expand their influence with a view ultimately to establishing a new monopoly of violence. Revolutions are moments too when the inability of the authorities to enforce law and order often makes violence a rational way of pressing one's claims and when, to make a very obvious point, the general collapse of order allows crime to flourish. These are familiar ways of thinking, and they could be said to share a view of violence as essentially instrumental, a means of seeking to consolidate power, of crushing opposition, of achieving sometimes quite small-scale local or personal gains. The ubiquity of violence in the Russian Civil War, however, has encouraged scholars, particularly in Germany, and I'm thinking of historians like uh, Dietrich Bayrau or the students around Jörg Babarovsky, who've sought to think about violence in new ways, one that we might call, very generally, phenomenological rather than instrumental. They're concerned to differentiate types of violence, to pay attention to the differential meanings, contexts, and social effects of violence. The violence of pogrom, for example, the violence of a rape, or the violence meted out to peasant rebels are all things that need to be looked at contextually and in a differentiated way. These scholars have shown how violence can be used to challenge hierarchies of power, to seek to create new hierarchies, to dramatize challenges of all kinds to the existing order. Felix Schnell's work on the warlords in the Ukraine, for example, shows how they used violence to forge bonds among themselves, to bolster social identities. In other contexts, of course, violence is used primarily as a means of communication, a means of disseminating messages that are, one hopes will inspire terror in one's enemies. Um, and in more general terms, ideas like cultures of violence, even symbolic violence, which is a, a term uh, pioneered by Pierre Bourdieu, these have become sort of ways of trying to grapple with forms of violence that don't obviously lend themselves to an approach that stresses their rationality, their use as a means to achieve a particular end. To move on to more of these five thematic issues, one significant development in the historiography in the new century has been to position the revolutions of 1917 
squarely in a narrative that commences with the outbreak of war in 1914 and ends with the establishment of a Soviet state in 1922. Peter Holquist has called the period from 1914 to 1922 a continuum of crisis. An older view of the relationship of the First World War to the conflicts that rent Europe between 1918 and 1923 focused on the idea of brutalization. George Mosser argued that trench warfare normalized violence and created a deep-rooted culture of militarism, especially among veterans of the Great War. And this fueled the dynamic of revolutionary, counter-revolutionary, and nationalist violence that erupted across Central and Eastern Europe between 1918 and 1923. Certainly, I think the First World War inured men to sickening levels of violence and saw a wholesale cheapening of life and the perceived value of life. It also brought a shuddering halt to developments that had taken place through the 19th century to introduce recognized international standards for conducting warfare and for protecting civilians. Nevertheless, I think recent historiography has challenged the idea of brutalization as one that helps to make a general sense of the violence of civil war. Most veterans settled back into civilian life without too much strain. Conversely, countries such as Spain and Finland that had not been involved in the First World War nevertheless saw sickening levels of violence, particularly true in Finland. I just mentioned Peter Holquist in the uh, context of coining this phrase, a continuum of crisis. He's associated with what's sometimes called the modernity school, a school of uh, now not so young uh, US scholars who in the 1990s proposed that the First World War in all belligerent states saw a massive expansion a militarization of practices that had their origins in 19th century Europe in the efforts of nationalizing states to shape what was often called the social body. They suggest that practices of categorizing society into sharply differentiated groups, practices of information gathering, of policing, of deportation, were common to modernizing states, but were amplified by the First World War and amplified with particular violence in Tsarist Russia. Their work, I think, is useful in demonstrating how porous was the boundary between the military front and the home front, how easily practices developed in battle were brought home, such as the taking of hostages or the attempt at deportation of other populations. But I think different developments are stimulated by 1917, and so to greater an emphasis on continuity between 1914 and 1922 can be misleading. The second point I wanted to mention of a thematic kind relates to ideology, but it also relates to the point I've just made about what is new that comes out of the revolution itself. Some historians insist that radically new ways of thinking about politics emerge out of the Russian Revolution and that are translated into action with the Civil War. Most notoriously, perhaps, uh, Stéphane Courtois in the Black Book of Communism emphasizes the Bolshevik commitment to what he calls a genocide of class that he sees as adumbrating the racial genocide of the Nazis. And one can certainly find instances that might support that. Notoriously, the Czechist Martin Latsis declared that we do not conduct war against individuals, but exterminate the bourgeoisie as a class. In this perspective, ideology is seen as the prime begetter of violence. Another instance about which Peter Holquist has written is the order in January 1919 to wage merciless mass terror against the Don Cossacks, which led to huge numbers of executions and attempts at deportation. Nevertheless, a degree of caution, I think, is necessary. Lenin was certainly not above using some terrifying verbs. Istreblienie, is a noun actually, istreblyat, 
um, is, a, is a verb that is used from time to time by the Bolsheviks, including by Lenin, particularly in the context of the attempt to retake Kazan from the Czech forces in uh, June 1919. But in general, he cautions people like Latsis to say, uh, saying that the extermination of the bourgeoisie is a misunderstanding of what the revolution is about. And indeed, the order to eliminate Cossacks is quickly rescinded. I'm therefore a little bit skeptical of the idea that the entirety of violence in the Civil War can be read in terms of what is sometimes called excisionary violence. The idea that this is violence designed to purge society of contaminating elements. That seems to me to be much, much more true of Stalinist violence than it is of what is a very, very complex mix of violence in the Civil War. But I don't, by that uh, qualification, wish to deny the centrality of ideology, particularly for the Bolsheviks in the Civil War. They looked to terror as a, re as a necessary instrument of revolution, looking back to the Jacobins of, of 1793. They believed that uh, justification of, um, that they believed that revolutionary violence was necessary to destroy the institutionalized violence of the inherited social order. And they condemned those states that criticized them for this uh, justification of revolutionary violence for being arrant hypocrites in that they had sent millions of people to death in the First World War. The extent to which white violence is motivated by ideology has been rather more contentious, not least among historians writing in Russia since the 1990s. But I think it's hard to deny that white violence was at least inspired by a certain set of values and aspirations, even if these were never as systematized as the ideology of the Bolsheviks. The whites were, first and foremost, Russian nationalists who aspired to establish Russia one and indivisible. And this meant, obviously, uh, suppressing anarchy and restoring a strong state alongside the values of traditional Russia, particularly those of the Orthodox Church. What united them emotionally was a passionate detestation of Bolshevism, which they saw as a German-Jewish conspiracy inflicted on the Russian people. Naturally, they detested class conflict, and they feared and hated the revolutionary masses, that wild beast, as um, Ariadna Tirkova Williams called them. If we move on thirdly to red and white terror, there has again been very interesting work done by scholars in Russia since uh, 1991, especially on the mechanisms of the terror, its interrelationship with the part, so uh, especially on the mechanisms of the Cheka launching terror and on the institutional relationships of the Cheka to the party. There have also been one or two good studies of the Cheka in particular local contexts. It's well known that the Cheka was called into existence in December 1917 to combat counter-revolution and speculation and to work explicitly outside the framework of law. Doubtless, counter-revolutionary plots were rife, though by the end of the Civil War, I think, the threat to the regime came less from counter-revolution than from peasant insurgency. New work, however, shows how much the Cheka met with opposition from the first, from local Soviets who tried to subordinate Cheka organizations at the provincial and Uyazd or county level to the Soviets. And as the Soviets themselves were undermined by the party, the same phenomenon of local party organizations seeking to impose control over the Cheka is also evident. It's also worth pointing out that pressure for terror came as much from below as from on top. After the attempt on Lenin's life on the 30th of August 1918, pressure for terror emanated from many grassroots party activists. A telegram from the Tarnovskaya cell in our Artlatovsky Uyazd in Simbirsk screamed, for every fallen leader, hundreds of thousands of bloodsuckers and bandits will be exterminated. Every attempt to curb the Cheka 
beginning with the resolution on observing legality passed by the 6th Congress of Soviets on the 6th to 8th of November 1918 failed. And although such attempts continued through the Civil War right through into 1921, they were not particularly effective. There were, however, many in the party who objected strenuously to the fact that the Cheka operated outside any legal uh, context. When, in 1995, Alexei Litvin, a Russian historian, published a book on the Red and White Terror in Russia, which stressed the involvement of whites as well as reds in terror, it met with criticism from historians who claimed that the reds had been far worse than the whites. Filstinsky, for example, claimed that on their territories, the whites did not organize organs analogous to the Cheka or revolutionary tribunals or Revoyen Sovieti. White leaders, they claimed, never urged shootings, terrors, or the terror, or the taking of hostages. In fact, whites did have surveillance and counterintelligence agencies, and I think it's very hard to argue that there wasn't a white terror. General Tienikin's troops took few, if any, prisoners during the formative period of the volunteer army. The expansion of his army into the Ukraine after the withdrawal of the Germans in 1918 enabled an unprecedented mass murder of Jews, um, in which the Pietlurists were prime actors, uh, with casualties as high as 100,000. Similarly, in Siberia, Kolchak's new all Russian state formally sanctioned summary executions of uh, those they suspected of Bolsheviks, condoned mass floggings, and moved brutally to crush all real and imagined forms of what they called Bolshevik criminality. It's true that there were real differences between red and white terror. The zeal of local Czechists constantly led to wild excesses, but formally the Cheka carried out perfunctory trial, wrote reports, whereas white terror, by contrast, was often the consequence of officers allowing their men to go on the rampage. And this was especially true of those warlords, the Atamani in uh, the Far East, who were only loosely connected to Kolchak's regime. There's also a kind of problematic issue that we have to sort of weave in to this picture, which is the sustained attempt by the Bolsheviks or certain elements of the Bolsheviks to institutionalize new forms of law. So new systems of popular justice were instituted, which themselves intermesh with and are gradually overcome um, in the course of, uh, and gradually serve to uh, Set, uh, set up a counter to the Cheka. I won't say much about popular violence, this is my fourth point, except to say that it's rooted in economic collapse as much as in the collapse of state power. There's a chronic shortage of food, especially in the cities, and this leads to all kinds of uh, forms of uh, speculation, as it's called. And the Bolsheviks turn to the peasants with violence in order to seize grain. So long as the whites, and I could talk in more detail, but I won't, so long as the white threat hung over the peasantry, they were careful not to expand levels of violence beyond the, the local. But with the Bolshevik victory in 1920, one sees the beginnings of nationwide insurgencies from some 50 in all in the winter of 1920 to 21, which take in Western Siberia on a massive scale, Tambov in the south of, of, of Russia, right through to places like Karelia. The final point I want to make relates to state authority. One of the ways of thinking about violence by certain scholars, and I think of somebody like Eric Landis in the UK, has been to stress how violence is used as a central way of making a new state. One can argue about the relative importance of violence against organization, the party, the Soviets, ideology, propaganda, but this view emphasizes the fact that 
in order to create a state, one had to curtail local, uh, local autonomy, one had to increase the power of higher level agencies, and so long as the Bolsheviks were involved in civil war, the numbers of troops at their disposal was always limited, and so their authority was very, very uneven across the space that they controlled within European Russia. They were not a weak, a weak state, but it was only in the winter of 1920 to 21, faced by massive peasant insurgency, that they were able to garrison troops in the countryside and begin to set up the rudiments of a new state. To conclude, as I've suggested, the extent to which one would interpret the Bolshevik consolidation of power as entirely reliant on violence is disputable, but certainly terror, organization, propaganda, military leadership, even popular support, all serve as ingredients in the mix which leads ultimately to Bolshevik victory. But if there's anything to learn from this recent historiography, and as I've tried to suggest, it comes in very different forms, it is that different types of violence existed, interacted, contradicted one another. Much came from the top downwards, but there were also ways, particularly in respect of peasant violence or local communities settling scores with one another that came from the bottom up. The context was one of general breakdown of law and order, but also of a desperate struggle for survival brought about by the collapse of war. There was certainly a strong element of ideology that inspired violence, but much violence was opportunistic, reactive, motivated by fear and uncertainty. It all reminds me of the three principles that Clausewitz uh, enunciated in his famous text on war. He said that all war is a variable combination of passion, reason, and chance, and it seems to me that the Russian Revolution bears that out spectacularly. Thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor, also for this presentation, which is, I think, a good uh, point, a good introduction to further discussions, and which turns our attention on two points, namely on the importance of social historical perspective when um, researching the history, also encompassing not only the period 1970, 1921, but also uh, what was uh, before. First World War, and secondly, uh, it uh, puts a question whether we should make a certain form of balance or equality between red and white terror. But I think we will discuss this, we'll discuss it, uh, discuss it uh, further. And now I would like, teraz chciałbym poprosić profesora Bosiewskiego. Now I give the floor to Professor Adam Bosiewski, last speaker, to give us a paper on totalitarian aspects of Marxism and Russian Revolution. Thank you. Director, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, whilst thanking for inviting me here, I'd like to refer three to three issues which are decisive to the question of utopia and the lawless state. But first and foremost, the totalitarianism that the Russian revolutions uh, brought up. This is, of course, a wider topic because the Russian Revolution is not only uh, 1917 as proposed by the Russian historiography. We've been discussing for 100 years already. There are many concepts, but please know that those are not a holistic concepts. These are these concepts are too narrow, and this is why the concept of the Bolshevik Revolution, or oh, sorry, the, the Russian Revolution, needs further uh, research. Furthermore, there has been an ongoing discussion about to what extent 
the build-up of totalitarianism in Russia is Russian and its roots. As the past professor Kornat said, uh, quoting historians or we'll say analysts today, and that applies to us even today as we speak. So are three questions that I'd like to talk to you about peculiarity of the Russian revolutions about the Soviet coup and the terrible transformation and the reception or perception of that concept, which is generally negative, which also affects us, because as we know, his history is the teacher of life. If we are looking at history as a forecasting tool, uh, uh, we should take it into consideration. This is the reason why we met him today. When we speak about some peculiarity of the Russian Revolution, indeed it is to a certain extent peculiar, but it also shows some semblance with the French Revolution, the Jacobin part of it. But as the historians, especially Soviet historians, wrote, this aspect results from uh, backwardness, namely too dramatic a leap between uh, feudalism into socialism. In that sense, the revolution seems to be anti-state, very similar to the revolution in, Fran in France, which turned against the absolutism, absolutism of the king and promoted egalitarianism, which is also something that is a popular thought, uh, which is a popular thought among the revolutionaries even today. Uh, the French absolutism's uh, main uh, adage was that the king is the state. So if someone turned against the king, he or she turned against the state. The same held true for the Soviet Revolution with the Tsarist uh, authority, authoritarianism. In Russia, Marxism was very limited. One Plehanov that was deemed the founder of uh, Russian Marxism, a Menshevik and a Narodnik, first and foremost, used radicalism. And what was also absent in Germany and in France, he used very utopian ideas of popularity, which was very typical of Russia. The first Marxist revolution that uh, was established in Geneva only uh, promoted this form of Marxism for a very short time. Uh, and Marxism as such was illegal in its essence. If you propose to tear down the existing order, then it is hardly imaginable that you would be tolerated as a legal organization. But this idea is more typical of anarchists than Marxists themselves, although Marxist was uh, to a large extent uh, or shared some characteristics with uh, anarchists. Now, there was a certain time shift there because uh, they called themselves social de democracy, but it was not social democracy that already existed in the West, where Edward Bernstein proposed a revision of the concept of Marxist revolution. In Russia, all of the leftist movements or the progressivist movements 
never denounced the revolution. And these very strong egalitarian slogans were particularly widespread in 1905 and 06. In the Soviet historiography, and now in the Russian historiography, that was the first Russian revolution, and it must not be underestimated. This was uh, done in order to pull down the Tsarist system. Now, the reaction of the government to this idea was very clear, and it spiraled into violence as a result of which radicalism uh, was boosted even further. And against this backdrop, Lenin and the Bolsheviks are, first of all, a marginalized or a marginal force, and uh, as a force that uh, hardly anyone treated seriously, especially uh, in the government. Now, the uh, Socialist Democratic uh, Workers' Party of Russia split. Now, ac according to Lenin's thought, the party could be divided into two groups, and the Bolsheviks were actually the minority, in spite of their name, Bolsheviks, which implies being the majority. Now, it is not the time and place to count, uh, you know, votes and discuss who had the majority and who had the minority, because perhaps someone left the room and there was a smaller number of votes. But one way or another, they were considered a marginal group that nobody treated seriously. In the years 02, 03, Lenin published his most important work, uh, uh, What to Do, which picks up on some of the very um, anarchist thoughts, uh, and he proposes to establish a party of professional revolutionaries. And he says, give us a revolutionary organization and we will turn Russia upside down. Now, it is considered a bit of a strange appeal that's more targeted at the foreign powers. It seems that he says that if you allow us to organize this organization inside of Russia, we will turn Russia inside out. It, it looks like, or sounds like a promise given to someone from abroad. Now, this party of professional revolutionaries was to be built uh, using the military format and using certain democratic institutions that uh, included democratic centralism, for example, where you discuss certain solutions, but once they are adopted, then, just like in the military, the party must obey orders. And this, as Lenin said, was a new type army built on the military model. And many historians quote uh, Lenin uh, about contemporary military, who he said was a very good example of an efficient organization. Now, Lenin had never been to the army himself. He was never military, but had a lot of sentiment or a lot of sympathy for the army. And Lenin consistently proposes to liquidate bourgeoisie as a class. However, he never said, um, he, he never says it expressly that he wants to kill them out, or you know, he never proposes genocide. But right after the revolution, that is actually what happened. 
And then finally, the, the peasantry utopia, namely the posture to nationalize land, to pull down the uh, rights of ownership, especially for large landowners, and for that to be substituted with uh, large or small communes and cooperatives. And if we follow the constructs of the Russian anarchism, that was what was proposed. So this is the concept of a socialization of land. And then, in, under Stalin, that there was a return to feudalism of the peasantry. Now, for the Bolshevik Revolution, from today's point of view, it's um, worthwhile remi reminding the slogans of the revolution. First of all, to end the war immediately, and that was the, the famous decree on peace. Then secondly, land for the peasants, that's the socialization of land, later called nationalization of land. But uh, no damages were to be paid to the former owners. Thirdly, uh, the workers' control of production and establishing the council of uh, people's commissars. And again, at the outset, nobody treated these slogans seriously. A proposal for the Justice of Peace in uh, Petersburg to join in the construction of this new system. They received letters without appeal, and not a single judge replied to it. Because how do you answer a letter like that uh, when somebody tells you, that they, they write you saying that it's a, a workers' and peasants' government, which means illiterate, because most of them were illiterate, and that this illiterate government wants you to join in in the construction of a new system. But again, from a practical point of view, this is a totalitarian system that's being built from the very beginning. Although that name, that term, didn't exist, Giovanni Gentile came up with this term in 1919, and he may have uh, had the Bolshevik experience in mind when coining that term. On the 24th of November, a month after the revolution, the um, commissars issued the decree on courts, which is later called decree on courts number one, because there are two more to follow. And that decree, in principle, abolishes all of the pre-revolutionary legal order. The new courts, it says, should only follow previous laws to the extent uh, that that does not go against the revolutionary conscience and the revolutionary understanding of the law. And these are kind of strange uh, statements, not very clearly defined, but they remain the essence of the system. And clauses, provisions like this, were the foundation for the legal system, even though nobody was very clear on what they actually meant. The very well-known joke about socialist democracy that we had in Poland, no one knew what socialist democracy meant. The Russian joke said that the difference between democracy and socialist democracy is like between a chair and an electric chair. Which probably translates into English as well. So, in both cases, we have a chair, but uh, the implications of sitting on that chair are a little bit different. So, the decree on courts number one established the revolutionary uh, tribunals, which were modeled on the Jacobite France, and then the Commission. Uh, to fight against sabotage and counter-revolution was established. It was never um, formally 
named, so it's difficult how to call it, the military revolutionary tribunals, the revolutionary railway tribunals, and so on and so forth. After the revolution, Lenin issues the decree on press, which forbids the existence of all papers except for leftist Bolshevik papers and um, periodicals. And finally, the decree on land, which confiscated all of the land, which um, sounds like pure lawlessness. But the implications of this new type of legislation are very significant. In December 1917, the uh, People's Commissar's Council issues a decree on uh, the abolishment of the property law in cities. Now, this decree uh, is then copied in Poland by the 1945 Bierut decree, which says that uh, due to the necessity uh, to rebuild Warsaw, which had been destroyed during the war, the property rights on the territory of the city of Warsaw is transformed into the right of usufruct, the right to use land instead of being an owner. Now, this is not as extreme as the 1917 decree that confiscated, but it's uh, simple and it's nearly lawless. Now, if I had more time, I could tell you more about all the ins and outs of how that Bierut's decree was uh, or its aftermath even after 1989 in the Third Polish Republic. It was only um, abolished in 2010. And one of the reasons was that Warsaw has already been rebuilt, reconstructed, so its foundation's essence doesn't exist anymore. Other normative acts which were equally informed included the decree entitled The Homeland in Danger of 1918, whose author Lenin, who authored, by the way, up to 90 percent of normative acts, urged that spies and, uh, and saboteurs and similar, as the Lenin used to put it, should be shot on the spot, which brings the system uh, back to the times where the criminal system uh, provided no means of protecting individual against, against uh, um, lawlessness. Another decree abolished uh, handing down property. Uh, one of the authors uh, spoke in favor of uh, that act as uh, he found positive the ban on uh, uh, ear earring uh, real estate. My time is up. Uh, my time is not up. I've been controlling uh, the time. So 20 minutes indeed passed. Please wrap it up, sir. Okay, so the crowning of this system, the pinnacle of this system, was the Constitution of uh, July, 10th July uh, 90. 
1918. Lenin wrote that there, were, there had been no constitution like ours in the history of the world. Indeed, there never were. Uh, this constitution also enumerated groups of people who were actually outlawed. That group included people who didn't work, for example, clergy, gendarmes, the policemen of the former regime. So someone calculated or counted that that outlawed group uh, amounted up to 10 percent of the total population of the Lenin state. And finally, in December 1919, uh, the special decrees were enacted, or the guidelines of the criminal law of Soviet Union were enacted which provided for putting people into concentration camps for a definite or even indefinite time and outlawing certain people. So that testifies the out, uh, or, uh, lawlessness of the system. One minute. So, concluding, even though the system, sorry, the system that evaluated up to 1999 was the object of reception in the communist countries, which bred a lot of strange regulations. Uh, under Stalinism, the to totalitarianism uh, grew uh, freely, and also there were popular, uh, sorry, there were also um, political murders. murders. But that leads us to the concept of post-communism, which uh, breeds again this uh, vague nature of the Polish political parties and the organization of the social life that is, of course, more prominent in Russia. So these transfers are innumerable, and that was a separate topic for discussion. Thank you very much for that important contribution, which consisted of two parts. Part one showed us certain specificity of Russian Marxism, which led to totalitarianism solution, totalitarian solutions, and the second analyzed the early Soviet legal system. Very interesting. I also liked uh, uh, the Soviet textbook uh, speaking about the bourgeoisie and the progressive international law. So may I now throw the floor open for the discussion? Please introduce yourselves and be brief in asking your questions. Since we have the interpretation, I'll ask my question Russian. I thank you very much for that very interesting and inspiring historical scientific overviews of the events that happened between 1917 and 19 in various countries. My question is, to what extent the topic of February Revolution of 1917 is important in your work, because you haven't mentioned that revolution at all. But I understand that if we critically assess the events of the October Revolution, we should perhaps also consider the impact of the February 17 revolution. So this is what I wanted to ask. Evgeny Sergeyev, Moscow. Evgeny Sergeyev of Moscow. I have several questions 
I'll also be speaking in Russian. The first statement about the backwardness of Russia, this is not quite something that we should uh, uh, agree upon because Russia belongs to well, the fifth most important economies of the world. So uh, the revolution, the reason for revolution was not this backwardedness. Secondly, the Russian scientists propose a new concept, a concept of the great Russian revolution. 1917-1923, uh, divided up into three periods, February, October, and then local revolutions in the period 1822-23. So this is an absolutely new approach. And three, the third question, the civil war. I would call them civil wars rather than one war because they looked completely differently in various regions. And finally, the terror, we should draw a sign of an equal sign between white and red terror. I am not going to defend the Bolsheviks, but the whites, the terror of the whites, uh, was directed against not only the Bolshevik but also about minorities and uh, other groups like Jews. So we should reconsider the seriousness of the ter terror, whose terror was worse. And also the dependence of the Vucheka organs. After 1917, this question was discussed in the Bolshevik organization. There was a struggle, which was correctly uh, described by uh, Professor Smith. There were the committees, the local Bolshevik committees on one hand, and there were those Cheka organizations on the other. So Cheka was taken over or covered by, by the party eventually. And the final question, I will give the floor back to the panelists. My name is Andrzej Kopczyński. What was the attitude of the Bolshevik Revolution towards the Orthodox Church, and where did the persecution of clergy start? Where did it start? Grzegorz Gołębiowski, who represents the territorial organization in Lublin. In the historical sciences, we speak quite a lot of the impact of the Soviet Revolution on reinstating the Polish independence. Could you please elaborate on that? Because even the contemporary publications read that the October Revolution impacted the Poland's regaining its independence again. What is the correct, let's say, um, reference to that? What's the correct so the explanation? Four minute, minutes each. Panelists, please. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to the February Revolution, I would say this. Indeed, in the Polish historical perception, the Bolshevik Revolution obscures everything else. It is the central event. However, the February Revolution, although very important, doesn't and has never been a field of 
intensive, intensive scientific deliberations, except for uh, Professor Bazilov's book, which was written in uh, during the communism times in Poland. As regards the impact of the February Revolution, that was actually discussed in the purely Polish context, namely the impact that it borne on the Polish, on the Poland's uh, regaining its independence. We should recall the historical uh, decree of 1921 about the uh, freedom of the Polish nation and a loose alliance with Russia. Uh, the border uh, resembling uh, with the border resembling the pre-partition border. Professor Andrusiewicz post uh, published recently a biography of the Prime Minister Kierenski, but this book is uh, not based on the sources, but it's a rather uh, an ambitious historical essay. Now, as it comes. So, as regards your statement, I shouldn't uh, really contradict the statements that I uh, recalled as the statement made by statements made by historians in the pre-war period. As the scientists formulated and uh, proposed uh, the tier of three revolutionary processes, namely the October Revolution was one, the forced collectivization and industrialization decreed by Stalin is the second process, and the Stalin's uh, criminal uh, settling accounts with the old Bolsheviks elite will be the third stage of the revolution. This is debatable, but regarding revolution as a process, as a continuum, would be a legitimate thought in history. I think for the next question, Professor Boschatsky is going to handle that. And your final question, whether this great socialism October revolution, uh, whether or not it had an impact on Poland. Setting propaganda aside, it definitely did, because it made Russia leave the Entente, the coalition. Let's imagine that Russia not leaving the coalition, staying in the Entente, it means in other words, that Russia would also contribute to creating the new order during the Versailles conference, which would have greatly impact Poland. Of course, the communist propaganda stated that Lenin brought us freedom. Uh, that definitely uh, augments or supports the statement that the revolution had a tremendous impact on the contemporary history of Poland. Moreover, Sovmarkom uh, decreed uh, in August 1918 uh, the invalidity of uh, the Poland's partition. That said, of course, the Bolshevik propaganda, but also served the Polish diplomats in their preparation of various concepts of a struggle for regaining the former Polish territory and its place in the international community. Um, I will um, confine myself to three points that were raised. Um, first one about the importance of the February Revolution. I mean, the February Revolution was certainly a revolution in every sense. It overthrew the autocracy, it established political civil rights, women got the vote. There were promises of major social reform. Um, I think 
a key problem was that the understanding of democracy was very, very confused for the liberal privileged people who um, elected themselves um, members of the provisional government. The idea was very, very much one of a liberal regime tied to the rights of property and they were crucially concerned to back the revolution as a way of continuing the war. I think for the mass of the population, for peasants, for workers, non-Russian minorities and so on, the idea of democracy went much further. So there was already from the start a structural contradiction in this, uh, uh, with respect to this idea of what the revolution was about, what it should ch achieve, what did democracy or socialism mean. But I think the crucial thing is the war. The war brought nothing to millions of Russian people. They were anxious for peace. The provisional government saw the revolution as a way of trying to rally patriotism. And Kerensky, I think, made a fatal mistake with the June Offensive of 1917. And it is that, in my view, that really opens the floodgates to popular radicalization. That plus the Kerensky rebellion at the end of August really paves the way for the Bolsheviks. And up to that point, I think the Bolsheviks were very, very marginal, despite the sort of traditional narrative that puts emphasis on what is to be done, Lenin's return and so forth. On uh, Professor Sergeyev's uh, point about backwardness, I would entirely agree. I think that the roots of the revolution in Russia lie in a deeply backward country rapidly modernizing, but I think in the context of pressure from Germany, the US, Britain, and so on, Russia's great power status was threatened, the, the Tsarist, uh, the more intelligent of the Tsarist ministers recognized that if Russia were to maintain its place within the world, it had to industrialize, it had to modernize its defense forces. All that entailed things like uh, migration from the countryside, the emergence of new social classes, a increasingly uh, vocal middle class that demanded civil and political rights. And although I don't think those things in themselves made revolution inevitable, indeed I think it's arguable that after 1905, Russia was moving away from revolution. Nevertheless, the First World War was the straw that broke the camel's back, and the social contradictions that have been building up explode after February. Finally, uh, Professor Obchinsky's point about the church. Um, the revolution has a great impact on the Orthodox Church, which I think has only really become visible in the last 10 years. A, um, a, a council, a sabor, is uh, called. There are radical movements within the church that are also calling for democratization of church life. These create great tensions in the church, and the hierarchy after October, by and large, sides with the whites against the Bolsheviks. So there is a kind of way in which the church is identified, for better and for worse, with the white cause, certainly in Bolshevik propaganda. That said, Bolshevik policy against the church is far harsher than that of any other communist regime after it comes to power. There's a virulent hatred of religion, which isn't necessarily replicated in Eastern Europe after 1947, say. Yes, Stalinization brings persecution of the church, but the states are very, very quickly forced to recognize the strength of religion. In Russia, by contrast, religion is enormously influential still, but the Bolsheviks wage a kind of deeply um, militant policy of trying to subordinate the church, which fundamentally fails. And in the Second World War, they're forced to recognize that. But in a comparative perspective, I would say that um, if you compare the Bolsheviks with German Social Democrats, even with the Chinese after 1950, the depth of antipathy to religion on the Bolshevik side is extreme. Dziękuję, profesor Bosiacki. Thank you very much. Now, just to pick up on some of the things raised in the uh, questions, let me talk about the local revolutions and the red 
Terra versus White Terra. I also talk about the party attempts at controlling the church and also the Polish issue. Now we have uh, little time, so let me just say very briefly that the local revolutions that took part in the former Tsar's empire were very much inspired and supported, sustained by the Bolsheviks. And this is a truism. All we have to say is that the communist revolution in Poland, Felix Wiedewirski, for example, uh, said it was the Polish revolution. Uh, but, but the Polish revolution would never have happened if not for the Paddierska, the support, the stimulation of the so-called Polish Communist Revolution by the Soviet Union. And it's a sociologist question. To what extent can you impose this system in all of the states that emerged after the breakup of the Soviet Union, which is what ultimately happened, but they were constituent parts of the Tsarist and then Soviet Empire. Before the Second World War, they were to be incorporated in the Soviet Union. Now, about the Red Terror versus White Terror, now, I will be very careful about this. this th these are terms from the Bolshevist um, historiography and propaganda to some extent, which has been mentioned before. And as the professor uh, mentioned, it's the Ukavo Balier. Uh, who was more of a terrorist? And, and this is, I mean, it's pointless to argue about who was more of a terrorist. A civil war provoked by Lenin and the Bolsheviks is to be blamed on the people who caused it to happen. Now, about party control. Before 1921, that party control was definitely insufficient or hardly existent. Now, the civil war in Russia and the scale of the repressions uh, can be compared to Stalin's uh, Great Purge, where percentage quotas were defined. The first category was to be shot on sight, and then there was the second category, which was uh, to be imprisoned in the um, gulags or the lagers uh, with indefinite incarceration, and they were never to leave these camps because uh, they were the people who might oppose the government. And at that time, the party didn't control that either. The Bolshevik party didn't have the biggest significance in the times of the civil war. The individual people in the party did, but the party as a whole didn't. Now, as for the clergy, these repressions didn't start immediately. I read some of the newspapers from the October Revolution period. For several days, the press didn't notice that power had been taken over. And they kept warning people, including the Bolsheviks, not to start uh, a problem, uh, start a fuss, so to say. Lenin, on the other hand, kept threatening people with being shot, for example, if certain orders had not been uh, carried out. He says that repression should be intensified and so forth. And again, the communist historiography says that the terror started after the killing of two 
eminent uh, Bolshevik activists, including Voldarsky, who were members of the Cheka. Uh, but that was not really the case. It had started before that. So in the middle of 18, the repressions had been in full swing. Now, about the Polish aspect, this has already been answered by the previous speaker. Let me just say that um, autonomy was proposed for Poland by the Duma and the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party rejected it. And then there were different normative acts that declared that Poland would be given independence, but hardly any countries actually regained independence. I mean, Poland did and Finland did, but all of the other countries that were promised independence uh, did not receive it in the end because the Bolsheviks counteracted that. Thank you very much. This concludes our panel. Let me thank all the speakers and the audience, and let's now take a 15-minute long break.